we've had a couple of very, very, very important conversations this morning already about some of the more linear aspects of showing up and having a great mindset and being prepared to be the author who you are becoming. We are all emerging authors before we've written that first book. And our next speaker is very much into, uh, I, I would say, David, a little deeper conversation around around who we are and who we are here to be in a body on a planet. And just for those of you who don't know David, he is a multimedia artist, a video content creator, and an educator. He teaches something called natural law, objective morality, and occult sciences as part of his private initiative called freedomvibe.art. David also has a background in systems engineering, software development, sales, and marketing. So obviously, David, you have the, the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain communicating quite beautifully together. And I cannot wait to hear what you have to say about cultivating internal monarchy. So please uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Susan. And let me know if you can hear me OK. If not, I'll, I'll make an adjustment. And uh, so thank, thank you so much, Susan, to you in particular, to Tanya, of course and to everybody who is either helping to make this happen or and in participating whether that's as a speaker or as a just as a participant i would i wouldn't even say just we we are all in this together we're all making this happen so it's a real pleasure to be here this is actually the first time that i'm doing a live talk on these topics i've done uh, quite a few number of presentations so i am a little bit there's a little bit of nerves there with natural nervousness which i think is healthy um so i appreciate that um, but I'm very eager to share with you guys what I have today. I think I think you're going to get a lot of value out of that. So having said that, let me uh, let me I do have some slides prepared. Let me just put that into slideshow and then share my screen. One second. Okay. And you guys will let me know as usual if everything is looking good. Just adjusting a few things. Looks great. We can see that beautiful. Awesome. Awesome. So that's a that's a great start. So as uh as mentioned, I am uh just like you, I wear different hats. So I'm a content creator, I'm an educator, I'm also a sales professional. Um, I think in life that's where we find that we, you know, it's perfectly okay for us to wear different hats. So today I want to wear my hat of an educator and sharing some powerful ideas with you. And accordingly, I've called I'm calling this presentation cultivating internal monarchy and the subtitle is reclaiming the kingdom within so let's jump right in so just a little caveat on the front end there is nothing new under the sun and this might be bad news for someone who's saying well i'm going to invent something new i'm going to create a whole new idea um, what we're actually doing is we're just remembering things that are already true and we're just gaining knowledge and and you know, all coming back to understanding things that we probably already knew and know inside of us, but sometimes they need just need a little bit of encouragement to come back out to the surface. So uh, believe it or not, although it may seem like it, uh, nothing I'm going to share today is actually new knowledge. So it's, it's really based on timeless wisdom. All I want to do as part of this presentation is kind of share it from my unique perspective, from the perspective that I've been able to gain it. Um, and then reflect that back to you and allow you to take from it what you can. And I'll just add one other thing here. My goal is not that you believe anything I say. In fact, I don't want you to. I just want you to take this all under consideration and then you know, you'll be able to find out what's true for yourself. Great. So let me just minimize this because it's getting in the way. So as if you've watched any of my presentations, you, you probably notice that I always like to start off asking questions. And I'm not asking this, you know, feel free to comment in the, in the, in the chat. I mean, that's great. Um, but I, the main reason I'm asking this is for you to ask yourself. I wanna encourage you to ask yourself um, why, why you're here. And I would say not just why you're here for my presentation, but why you're here at all for, for this event. You know, why is this all important to you? So just, Maybe give that a second to think about it. If you want to share, go ahead. Um, that's awesome. We're here to, to share ideas with each other. Um, but most importantly, just kind of think about it in context to yourself, to what's got you motivated to show up today.
Now I'm going to give you my perspective. I, I have a lot of respect for, for you as an author or as an aspiring author, wherever you are in your journey. Um, I am not an author myself. I may become one someday. Um, I'm a, I share a lot of content through spoken word and through video. So in a way, these are kind of different ways to share knowledge. And I think they're all very valuable. But I actually have a lot of respect because I consider being an author and writing a book to be both a privilege and a duty. And the reason is, uh, first of all, I read books all the time, just, just like you probably do. And books is one of the main ways. It's not the only way, but it's one of the main ways that I gain new knowledge. And it's one of the way, main ways that I educate myself for whatever endeavors I want to pursue in life, whether it's personal or professional or both. So there is kind of a, a dual aspect to this is that you it's a privilege and not everybody's going to do it. And it's important to recognize that. Uh, but it's also a duty. It's a duty because when you agree to do it, you have basically taken on a very po a, a power. You've taken on a, a high level of power in that now you're going to disseminate information to many people. So I think just my perspective is that seeing that as a privilege and a duty puts it more in perspective. And then you start to care more and say, well, wow, this information, my book is going to potentially be read by hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, even maybe even millions of people or more. Um, it's worth really giving this consideration that I do the best I can to share the knowledge I'm going to share in the best possible way. So it's right in the title of the event, folks. It's not a, it's not a coincidence. It's, it's the Conscious Leaders Book Writing Summit. So all, all I want to do today, if nothing else, is just to help you a little bit to raise your own consciousness, right? It's always an internal, it's always internal work. I'm just sharing ideas, but I want to do that because I know that if that happens and when that happens, you're going to be a better author and better, you know, something more amazing is going to come out on the other side of the publishing process. So that's really all I want to do today. And I think that's, that's maybe a lot, but it's also just that one thing. So here's the point where I start to lose people. And I think there are certain fears around certain concepts. So I want to kind of lay that all to rest. Okay. So I'm just going to come out and say what I'm going to share with you today are what are called occulted concepts. And these are concepts related to mindset. Again, no surprise, we've been talking about mindset this whole time, and that's what this day is about, um, and psychology, and also just about around about the world around us, the world that we find ourselves in. And uh, I wanna invite you to release any fear associated with the word occult, because it's not an evil thing, it's not something bad. It simply means hidden, comes right from the Latin. Those of you who have studied Latin will recognize this immediately. It comes from the adjective occultus, hidden, or the verb to hide, occultare, and which ultimately comes from the I, which is oculus. You can see kind of the derivation. So all this is referring to is hidden knowledge. And you will know what I mean by that if some of these concepts are new to you, because if they're new to you, then all that means is they've been hidden from you until now, and now you're going to be exposed to them. Great. So let's dive in a little bit deeper. So when we talk about consciousness, what is that? Well, there's a couple of ways you can define it. You can define it very dryly as the ability to recognize patterns and meaning. I like to look at consciousness based on how it expresses itself. So this is true for all of us and even for the animals. It's not just unique to human beings. Our consciousness is expressed through three things. Our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions. And if you think about it, every way in which consciousness expresses itself in our reality, it's, it's one of those three. It's the thoughts, the progenitor, the first step, the mind, what's going on inside the mind, the emotions, how you feel about that. What is the emotion that comes up when a certain thought is brought forth? And then, of course, ultimately what you do with all that, how you act in the world. So these are the three expressions of consciousness. And I'd love if people chat, you know, how many people have even heard of 
this concept or is that like the first time you've heard somebody say that? I'm, I'm sure it's not for all of you, but I'd just be interested as we go through. I'm probably going to ask you if you are have even become aware of some of these concepts or if this is the first time that you're hearing it. It'd be very interesting for me to, to know that about you. And I'm not really able to monitor the chat while I'm doing the presentation, but afterwards, I'm definitely going to look at all of your comments. So another way to say the same thing, this thought, emotion, action can also be referred to maybe a little more colloquially as mind, heart, and guts. Why guts? Well, you, every, we all know these expressions. He, he hasn't got the guts to do it. You know, it's coming, that, that impulse to take action coming from the guts, right? So we, we've heard that so many times, and now you can see in context what it's referring to. Okay. So um, again, those of you who have seen any of my presentations, you know that I like to be very specific in defining things, because I think if we can agree on the definitions of terms, it's, as well as their origin, what's called the etymology, the origin of the words, it becomes much easier for us to have a conversation. So you may have, you've all, all of us have heard the word monarchy, right? And we probably have a, a, a kind of an intuitive sense of what it means. But the word actually has a very specific definition. It's coming from the Greek. It's coming from two Greek roots, monos, which means single, alone, and archon, which means master or ruler. So monarchy simply means rule by an individual, right? And obviously, I'm not writing the words in Greek. Greek does not have the same language as as uh, letters as English, but you know, go back and and you can quickly find if you if you know Greek already. I don't, I can't read it, but if you can, you'll be able to confirm that by looking at the original words. So when we talk about monarchy, we're all clear here that this is all this means is rule by one person or by one individual. Okay, so in context to this idea of internal monarchy. The question then becomes, if we want to take it deeper, is what is being ruled? So it is the mind. It's rulership of the mind. And you've heard it over and over again. It's all about your state of mind. In fact, the first two presentations or the presentation and the interview that we've already heard today, it's 80 to 90 percent mindset. I mean, it's right there. It always starts in the mind. And this is an occult principle called the principle of mentalism. And that is basically an understanding that we live in a mental universe. Basically, another way to think about it is we it's like one giant universal mind, one giant intelligence that is so vast that as individuals, it's hard for us to grasp it. But once we kind of understand that that's the nature of it, a lot of things in our lives make sense. And even in the small world, if you, for example, as an author or as an aspiring author, you know that in order for that to happen, it has to start with a single thought in your mind, namely, I'm going to write a book, right? If it doesn't, if it doesn't start there, it's not going to happen. So, but I am curious again, if, if the, if you, I would love to know if, who, which of you have either been exposed to the, what have been called the hermetic principles, the seven hermetic principles of which mentalism is, mentalism is the first, and, and also maybe you've even read uh, a well-known book on that, such as the Kybalion. So I, I just if you have been exposed to this, it would be great. If you haven't, that's cool. Now you've been exposed to it. So this is kind of opening up a new door in your own mind for further exploration. But again, when we talk about rulership and monarchy, it's all rulership is rulership of the mind. It's really... That's, that's a foundational principle, and we're going to see as we move forward why that is so important in context. So internal monarchy, the subject of what we're what I'm discussing today and what I'm sharing with you, if you want to translate it into a more colloquial way of thinking of it, it's simply self-ownership. You rule your own mind. You're in charge of you. You decide. You're the one who's activating your own free will and making all the choices. You decide how you want to uh, 
uh, you decide even you can't necessarily control every thought that's going to come in, but you can decide if you want to relate to that thought. You can't necessarily control your emotions, but you can decide how you want to act with respect to those emotions, because those emotions are pointing some something to your attention, and then you get to decide, right? So that's that's really all it means. It's you own you. You're the boss of you and no one else. And, and so there's both a, a privilege, there's both rights and responsibilities associated with that, as we're going to see. So this is the concept that we want to deepen as we go further into this presentation. So again, another, there are just different ways to express this. People have called it sovereignty. I think that's a perfectly valid way to express it. You again, the same, it all means the same thing. You are your own ruler and nobody else, right? And sovereignty also is a word that we can derive and understand a little better because I think a lot of times we use that term. I mean, there's even businesses like Sovereign Bank. People hear this so many times and it's like they don't even really think about it. They may have a vague notion that it refers to some kind of ruler, but they haven't really thought exactly what the word means. So I one of the things I want to give you to take away from today in all of your work, especially as authors, because you you are wordsmiths, you know, this is another insight. You are wordsmiths because you're using the power of the written word. So start, you know, if you haven't done so already, start to go and look behind, you know, peel the curtain back and look behind at the meaning behind certain words and where they come from. And you'll find that all of the important words in English, not just the ones that we're talking today, are going to reveal something to you. And sometimes they're going to reveal very deep and powerful truths and give you great aha moments. So sovereignty, if those of you who've studied Latin, you know that certain letters did not appear in classic Latin. So it's not an exact match letter for letter. But so the words have morphed a little bit. Don't let that trip you up. But sovereignty comes from two Latin roots, super, which means above or beyond. We all know that. And then regnum, which means rule or rulership. So all su super regnum means or sovereign means you are beyond rule. You are above rule. Specifically, you're above rule by others, right? But you do rule yourself. And ultimately, if you want to, if we want to be truthful about it, uh, there are we are ruled by the higher powers in creation that are beyond us, but not by other people, right? That is the main distinction. So hopefully that's all clear now. Obviously, share any comments or questions. And at the end, I'm happy to clarify anything. So internal monarchy is not a, a crazy out there concept. It's not something super esoteric or you know, that's something that should be that we would rarely come across. It's actually the most natural state. It is our natural state. This is something that I had to discover because I didn't realize this either. So if you're sitting there dumbfounded, like, how can you say that? You know, for most of my life, I didn't I didn't get this. Right. So I'm I'm definitely not sitting here on like a higher than thou position. I was completely clueless to all this. But once I understood it, I realized that this is just the natural state of the world. We're we're self rulers right? It's the most natural thing in the world. And it is the moral way to be. In other words, it is the right way. It is the right way that leads to good things, leads to all good things. And it's just, it's just our natural state. And anything or anyone that comes in to interfere with it, that is exactly what it is. It's, it's attempting to subvert it. But that is, that does not mean that that is right, or that is natural. We are naturally self rulers. And if we forget that, which I have, and you may have, and others certainly have, then uh, we're still here. It's never too late. It's never too late to get that back as long as we're here. However, there is a flip side to that as well. And this is, I think, part of the reason why this can be natural, but yet we don't necessarily see it expressed. And you, you, know, you may or may not embody this to a certain degree, I have not embodied this and still am learning how to embody it. So you might say, well, David, if this is all natural, why is there so much dissonance in this regard? The, the problem is, or I wouldn't say problem is not the right word. The key to understanding is that there are requirements in order to activate it. 
It's not just automatically activated. Just like a plant is not going to grow if it doesn't have the requisite ingredients, namely sunlight, fertile soil, water, nutrients, right? Even if we're talking hydroponics, there's still nutrients, even if there isn't soil. So there are minimum requirements for a plant to, for a seed to germinate and a plant to grow with that without them, doesn't matter how beautiful that seed is, doesn't matter how healthy that seed is, it's not going to grow. So it's the same way. Self-ownership has requirements. And as we move forward in this presentation, I'm going to share with you some of the requirements that I've been able to figure out from my own study that that will help you to kind of unlock and have an aha moment and understand that it's all very simple, but until you actually see it, you could miss it. And you may actually realize that you haven't been exposed to that, right? So let's talk about, about some of these requirements. And these aren't necessarily all of them. Again, this is all my take, what I've been able to piece together to share with you during this presentation. I'm just gonna take a sip here. So what is the first requirement for sovereignty? It's very simple. Knowing the difference between right and wrong. I, I can't explain it in any more simple terms. Every kid knows, you as a kid, you and I both knew that as even as kids, that it's wrong to steal. We could feel it in our body. We knew it intellectually, but also in our body, right? We all know it. You know, sometimes in life we go through life and we get distance from that knowing and we start to convince ourselves, oh, maybe I can push it a little bit. I can get away with certain things. And there's all kinds of, you know, justifications and mindsets that come up. But ultimately, it's just knowing, or I would say re knowing, remembering, because we all know it objective morality, and then just consistently applying that in our lives and always doing right by people. Don't take it, not taking what doesn't belong to you, not trying to force people to do things that they don't want to do, uh, but also standing up for yourself, as we're going to see. So just knowing from right from wrong, that is the first requirement to being sovereign, to activating internal monarchy. And I recognize, just like with the word occult, that people sometimes get uncomfortable speaking about morality. So I want to invite you to let us ground this together. And it's okay because morality is not a concept that is owned by religion. Religions do not own this concept, right? It's simply what is. It's sim it, it, another way to put it is it's just, again, it's the natural way, right? And like I said, you already know so if it's just a matter of uncovering that, now if it's still making you uncomfortable for whatever reason, that's cool. Why? All of your growth exists outside of your comfort zone. We already know that. We've talked about that already today and, and we will continue to. So if it makes you uncomfortable, cool. Recognize that and use that as a, as a pivot point, as a launching point to further your own personal development. Um, but I'm just just for now, I'm just gonna remind you that this is perfectly natural is just the way things are in nature. Great. Now I have a very powerful tool to share with you. And of course, there won't be enough time to really dive in deep on this on today's presentation. But I did do a full presentation on this. If you want to check it out, it's, a free, it's on my YouTube channel. So it's all free to watch. Um, but I just want to mention it here. The Trivium is a very powerful tool that you're gonna want to acquire if, if you're not already familiar with it, right? And comment in the chat, please comment. If you've heard of the Trivium before, if you know what it is, if you already use it, if you learned it, like whatever you wanna share about your knowledge of the Trivium, I'd be very interested to hear because I didn't find out about the Trivium until in the last couple of years. And I can say with certainty that had I known the trivium earlier, I could have saved myself a lot of grief. I was taken advantage of in a lot of ways um, and made, you know, had made bad decisions and allowed both people and circumstances to take advantage of me that if I had known the trivium, almost certainly none of that would happen would have happened. So I want to really invite you to to master this tool. It's low tech. It's just a learning tool. There's no actual technology involved. 
in classic Greek times and classic Latin times, as far as I know, it was regular teaching, right? Maybe not in, among all the peoples, because there was a slave class, and they would certainly have, you know, have taken this away from that class of people. But let's just say among the ruling class, their children, and then whatever other classes, they definitely taught their children the trivium. So real brief, just for the sake of time, trivium just means the a, a path, you know, the place where three paths meet. And it's a three-step process to learn and discover the truth and to figure out what's going on inside of ourselves and in the world around us. So knowledge, understanding, wisdom. Knowledge, you take in this new information, kind of like you're watching my presentations today. You're you're taking this all in. You're not going to immediately accept or reject what I'm saying. You're just saying, okay, David's saying this. I'm going to take this in. I'm making note of it. Bring it all in. Understanding or processing. Now I've got to draw on my experience in life, my intuition, my logic, ability to think logically and rationally, to eliminate contradictions in my own mind, you know, to eliminate cognitive dissonance. And you figure out what, if, what is actually true and what can you just throw away? Oh, that's BS. I don't need to pay attention. That's understanding. And then the last step is wisdom, action. Wisdom always means action. So basically, it, you can think of it like we're constantly upgrading our minds. We're constantly upgrading the software in our minds to have a better and more accurate model of, of the reality we find ourselves in so that we make better and more accurate and, and better and more accurate choices and ones that are going to lead to more freedom and less suffering. So again, if you haven't done so, I'd love to hear what your exposure to the trivium has been. And I invite you to deepen your understanding of this concept. Now, uh, I think just before we got on here, Susan mentioned about intelligence and we talked, we, it's, it's come up a couple of times in context. So um, that's awesome. The great, what I love about the word intelligence is it's right in the word. It tells you that it's holistic. Yeah, and Susan, you had mentioned right before I talked like the left brain and right brain. So this is exactly, this is the great thing about the word intelligence is it, it embodies that already because it's intella, which comes from intellect. Intellect is logic, reason, rational thought, language, structured thinking, and so on and so forth. Gents comes from the Latin genesis or genere. Genesis, the inception, creation, to generate, to create something. This is the right brain, the nurturing, the intuitive. Some, some people have called, uh, we often call intellect the masculine trait and genere, genesis the feminine trait, what is giving birth to ideas, what is giving birth to that which comes forth. So all I'm all this means to say is that's great. You want to you want to have both in balance. You don't want to only be in your left brain, and you also don't want to only be ruled by your emotions. You want to have them both in a nice, healthy balance, right? So, so you don't want to, uh, it would be a mistake, for example, you know, being totally in the left brain, you might become so skeptical that you're like, oh, that can't be true because you're completely shutting out your emotions and your intuition. On the other hand, you could become too naive and too gullible if you only think with your feelings, which we can't really do. It's not really, it's not really correct to think with your feelings. But you might just go along with something just because it makes you feel good. And uh, that would also be out of balance. So I'm curious if you want to share just kind of where you're at with that. You're, you know, how balance, how, how are you in terms of your own balance? Because I used to suffer, I used to suck at this. I was like way in my left brain for for way too long. Right. And then sometimes I was even way in my right brain. And it just, you know. All we can do is just recognize that we're meant to embody both of them. That's why we have two hemispheres to our brain. That's why we have both these. We have both intellect and intuition. So contemplate that a bit, share anything you want, but this is the third requirement to activating internal monarchy is just doing whatever you can to keep that whole mind brain in, in a nice, healthy balance. Great. So now that you now that you have that internal state starting to ramp up to a higher level of consciousness, 
it starts to express itself out in what you do. And again, if you want to apply this to the concept concept of being an author and writing a book, it's now going to inform what you do in that respect. And it may bring a whole new level of understanding to the process of writing that book or whatever you choose to do in life, because you're going to make better choices. That's that's really what it boils down to. You're going to make better choices for yourself. And you're going to make better choices as they impact the world around you, including those around you in your sphere of influence. And you're going to do that because you recognize that it's not that you take on responsibility. You always were. From day one, you were always responsible and you are right now. It's just that certain people and circumstances may have attempted to shield you from that. And sometimes for good reason. If you're a young child and you're mind is still coming online, you haven't fully activated your consciousness, of course, your parents are going to protect you from things that you wouldn't be able to figure out. So that's perfectly natural. But you were still responsible. It's just they have chosen to take temporary responsibility for you in order to steward you to a point where you can fully take the reins, right? Until you get until you get up to speed. But right now, as adults, we can agree that you're all responsible. And it's when you take responsibility using all the concepts that we've talked about so far that you make much better choices in life. Now, uh, let's talk really quick about the ego. I think there's, this is again, one of those points where there is a balance point. I've kind of seen both sides. I've seen uh, ideologies and kind of thoughts where, you know, sometimes religious thoughts where, there's kind of a rejection of the ego. We need to suppress it. The ego is evil, even I've heard some people say. And then I've heard the other side, and I've seen it, where people are like, the ego is the, is all that matters. We should worship the ego. And I can tell you there are people who are on both sides of that continuum, and I've met them. And you probably have too. You know, there's pure ego, and then there's pure suppression of the ego. Well, I don't know about you. But if I were going to write a book, and I know this is true for uh, the content that I create, I'm very happy to have an ego because the ego is the individual part of me that allows me to express myself as a unique individual and express my personality and to get stuff done. So I would certainly not reject that. But I can also tell you 100% that my ego is not in charge of me. No, it is not. I'm in charge of my ego. I'm ruling it. But I'm happy to use it. I'm happy to use it because it, I consider it a gift. I consider it a part of who I am. And I consider it a way to express myself in the world. So I want to invite you to do the same. You've got to have an ego to write a book. I mean, let's be honest here. You've got to have an ego. And we all do. I mean, it's not like you're not, you don't have one. But it's important to kind of see where in perspective that falls. That gives you enough impulse to do the things you need to do to move that forward, whatever you need to do while also not letting your ego, you know, not letting, for example, the fame and fortune to be what it's all about. Like, I'm only doing it for the fame and fortune, right? I'm only doing it for the for the sales of the books, what, whatever, you know, highly ego-driven state or for the money or whatever. So we recognize that there is a balance point, but of course we want to, we need to have that balance. So part of being in, an internal monarch is you own your ego, not the other way around. And you definitely know its value and its place in your life. Okay. So those, we could probably come up with other requirements, but I think those are the most important ones that if you, if you can kind of wrap your head around it and start to inculcate them, it's going to move you so far along in this path. It's going to be incredible. You know, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to have a hard time looking back and seeing where you were just from starting to master those. So now that we've talked about that, I want to sh shift gears a little bit and talk about how this relates to the world around you because you and I were individuals, but we're relating. You know, we're interacting with each other. You're you, I'm me, and we have a point of interface. So how does that work? How does the internal monarchy, which is an internal state, express itself when we, when we interact with each other? In other words, through relationships. Well, it's reciprocal. Again, this will probably be super obvious by now, but I think it's worth saying. If I'm a sovereign and you're a sovereign too, we just need to respect each other. I need to respect your rights just like you respect mine. I don't try to harm you. You don't try to harm me. I leave you be. I leave you in peace. 
If we want to do something voluntarily, like this great event that we're all participating in, that's awesome. But nobody was forced to come here. Ray, you know, comment in the chat, <laughs> kind of a joke, comment in the chat if you were forced to come to this event. If somebody forced you against your will through coercion to show up here today, nobody, right? So it's just that reciprocity, right? So all more, so going back to morality, it just means it's all based on mutual voluntary consent and everyone's a unique individual bringing their unique gifts and talents to the table. And isn't that amazing? So that's the first principle, okay? This has been called in the occult tradition since I've been mentioning that. This is known in the occult as the sacred feminine principle of non-aggression. This is the, the formal name for it in the occult traditions. And, or we could just call it the non-aggression principle because we basically embody that we are not going to aggress others. We're not going to impose violence on them. We're not going to try to forcefully take things that do not belong to us. Okay, super simple to understand again. Even as kids, we understood this intuitively, and now we can understand it also intellectually. The second step, we stand up for ourselves. We don't let others control our feelings, our thought, feeling, and actions, or try to impose their, their will or their ideologies on us, right? So we defend ourselves. And defense is also physical, and it's very important that we have physical defense, but I would say more than 80 to 90% of the time in context, defense is psychological. And this is why I wanna encourage you to not just think of defense and, and defending yourself as only a physical state, because yes, that is important and that is a requirement, but probably the way most people are taken advantage of today, and I know this is true for me, it is, uh, and, and I've had some very embarrassing stories. I'm probably only not gonna share them because I'm. I'm not, I can't see the time and I'm a little worried that we're going to run out of time, but um, I could definitely share some stories. Um, so we, the, the point of uh, self-defense is you, def you, because you are the sovereign of your own mind, imagine if you're the king or queen of your mind, you think about a kingdom in the real world. What does the king do? He's got a standing army. And if somebody tries to attack, it's all defense, right? Or they might even, yeah, I mean, they're going to do whatever they can to defend the kingdom. Same thing with your mind. You do whatever it takes. You do not let People get inside your head and, and instill bad ideas in your mind and try to manipulate you. And that's all part of self-defense, psychological self-defense. And that's the second attribute of external expression of internal monarchy. So this is just like the other principle is the sacred feminine. This is known as the sacred masculine principle of self-defense. You stand up for yourself against the bully, against the tyrant, against the person who's trying to impose themselves. And this is true whether you're a child or you're an adult. Every, everybody should stand up for themselves, right? And again, guilty of not doing this, but it's never too late to learn the lesson. So when we put these two together, we call this in the occult, the dual pillars of enlightenment. Everybody's talking about enlightenment. What is enlightenment? It seems like something that's so far away to achieve. And there may be aspects of light enlightenment at a higher level that are, but from this perspective, enlightenment is really simple. All you have to do is embody two main attributes to interacting with the world around you. Don't harm others, defend yourself. Don't take, don't take shit from others. Stand up for yourself. But also don't be the bully, don't be the tyrant. It's, it's two sides of the same, right? The dual pillars of enlightenment. I'm just curious, because this is a more of an occulted concept, I would love to hear if anybody's already run across this concept as well. So go ahead and comment that if you if you are familiar with that. And if you have studied the occult at all, I'd love to hear like what what traditions or studies you've already delved into. Just because there are many traditions in the occult, so just out of curiosity, if you're willing to share that. So to kind of ground it for a second, take a deep breath. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. All we're doing is we're on a path. We're on a path to growth. We're on a path to self-mastery. This is why we, you and I and many others invest so much time and energy and even our hard-earned money into coaching and mentorship and training because we're on a path to self-mastery. All we're doing is leveling up, right? And all I'm doing and sharing this with you today is helping you to level up even a bit more. 
You know, it might be a small bit. It might be a great bit. Whatever it is for you, that's awesome. But you don't have to beat yourself up if, you know, if you didn't know something already or it's like, geez, why didn't I know that? Or that's so obvious. Or why why have I not been able to embody that? Or I've not, you know, I'm struggling with that. It's cool. It's cool. I give you permission for that. We're here to help each other. We need to have each other's backs. I, I want to have your back and I'm sure you want, you know, you want to have my back and others. So we're in this together. So we're coming here to the close and I know I've shared a lot of stuff. I I know I have a tendency to speak quickly, but I've tried to pace myself here. I didn't want to make the presentation super long to kind of leave some space for comments, questions. We're, we've got a few more to go here, uh, but I just want to encourage you to, to realize this truth. And that is on the path to enlightenment, there's really only two mistakes that you can make. Not starting and not going all the way. So now bringing it all back to your journey as an aspiring author, or maybe an author who's going to write another book, wherever you are in that journey, just by virtue of, these, of infusing these ideas and then taking them as you wish, as you desire, as you will, and incorporating them into your day-to-day -day life as part of your life skills, I can guarantee you this. When you do that, whatever book you were already writing or about to write or in the process of writing, wherever you're at, it's going to now have it be infused with that higher level of consciousness that you have taken on. And just imagine, I mean, if you can just imagine, give yourself permission to feel how exciting or enthusiastic that, that might make you feel, knowing that you can now use these concepts to level up whatever words come out of your mind, whatever words get on on paper or typed out. I mean, it's incredible, right? It's, it, it's got to inspire. It's got to be all inspiring. It is to me. And I certainly hope it is to you. So just by accepting the challenge. So I am giving you a challenge, essentially. I'm challenging you to not just let it go in one ear and out the other. I want to challenge you to actually take in what I've said here. If you want to go back and watch the presentation, that's awesome. You may find that that's going to be very helpful. I want you to challenge yourself to see what you what can you do to activate this internal monarchy or activate it at a higher level of where you're already at. Just by accepting the challenge, even if you haven't done anything yet, you've already raised your consciousness. As long as you are being honest with yourself and saying, yes, I am truthfully taking this challenge on, right? Again, I'm not charging any money for this. I'm just giving this away to you. This is just my gift to you to do with as you desire. But if you accept that challenge, you're already halfway there. And I want to congratulate you for doing that. Okay. And any book you write, it, like I said, it's got, it, it cannot not be this way. It is going to be a better book. It's going to be a better book. And just wow. Wait till that book hits the stands. Wait till it gets published. Amazing. So I want to thank, again, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, real quick, you can find me on YouTube, Freedom Vibe Art, my website, freedomvibe.art. If you want to reach out to me, I you know I welcome, I, I answer all my emails. So, you, know, you can re reach out for any reason at all, David at freedomvibe.art. And uh, it's been my pleasure to share this material with you today. I, I'm, and I'm now I'm really looking forward to seeing, to hearing what you guys think and to see what you wrote. Fabulous, David. Thank you so much. That was really intriguing. There, were, I, I've taken a lot of notes, and I have a lot of questions myself. But I, I think maybe we'll start with uh, any questions from our participants. Does anybody have anything they or comments? Even is anything that David has said made you think of something or wonder something? Or do we have any questions for David from the floor? Just uh, if you want to put your hand up. And of course, we do that by going down to reactions at the bottom of your Zoom screen and clicking on that. And there's an option to raise your hand there when you're ready. So David, while we're seeing if anybody else has any questions, there are quite a few comments in the chat. I, I'd like to go back to this concept of mentalism and, and its relationship to hermeticism, because I'm quite familiar with hermeticism. 
but I've never heard uh, the phrase mentalism raised before in that context. So I, I'm very curious about that. If you could tell tell us more about mentalism. Yep, great, great. Um, the, I'll just tell you how I interpret it. We basically live in a mental universe. So everything is mind. It's like we're in one giant mind and even physical objects are infused with the same, you know, from the same infinite consciousness of everything that is, right? And uh, what happens is, I think, at, again, we're since we're talking about authors and writing books here, it, it's maybe a good analogy. The uh, If you think about the uh, the characters in a book, whether it's a fiction book, let's just take a fiction book, for example, the characters that the authors write, when you read that book, it's like those characters come to life, right? They are they are alive. They have thoughts, feelings. They do things. They have experiences. They have characteristics, and you can you can start to see them in your own mind. But yet, they all exist in the mind of the author, right? right. So the, the principle of mentalism is the universe. Every all of reality is the same way. We are all existing in the giant mind of everything that is. Oh, that's interesting. I, I think that's pretty cool. So we we are all part of each other. We are all part of each other. And yet, paradoxically, because there are paradoxes, yeah. we are also individuals. And I think that's and, something that sometimes we struggle with. We're all individuals, but we're connected. So it's not to say that we're, uh, I'm not trying to su suggest that we're like a hive mind or you know, we're all the same person, you know, fooling ourselves. In a way, we are kind of fooled. But we are kind of stepping down consciousness to the point where we see our, we literally experience reality as individuals. So we literally can't see sometimes the connection, but we can feel it. It's always there. We're always connected. But we, as individuals, we have a unique experience. We want to honor that and allow each individual to express itself. So it's kind of, we have to be careful about that, not to try to suggest that there's some kind of claim of, of, uh, um, like, what's the word, like a uh, hive mind or um, collectivism. I am in no way a collectivist. I, I recognize and respect the individual. But yes, the, the deeper truth is we are all connected at a much deeper level. Beautiful. Uh, one other thing that I'd like to, oops, I'll, I'll go back to, I'll let Kelly ask her question first, sorry. I, I could go on and on, so <laughs> we'll, we'll stop maybe here. Kelly, what would you like to add to the conversation? Well, this what a great talk, David. Thank you. I would okay. like to just comment and maybe get more clarity on um, the concept that you presented, wisdom as action. I've never heard it said that way. When I think of wisdom, I think of the, the knowledge and the emotion and the being. And I suppose that's where maybe the action comes in. So I'd like a little more clarity on that. And then also, you know, I think sometimes personally, I could get caught in the always raising my consciousness, like always on that path to be more and go higher. And then I get stuck in like, oh, when do I actually put that out to the world? Okay, there's really great points. Um, sh so sharing about the first part, uh, as I've learned it, wisdom is action. There is, there is a knowing and an understanding, which is also very important. And that's why I think in the trivium, we talk about all three. So having knowledge, which I personally value very highly, and I think you guys probably would too, because if you're writing books, having that knowledge to be able to draw upon is important. Understanding is extremely important because it, if you just know something or you have some information in your head, but you don't really understand it, like there's a gap right there. So those two things are extremely important. Wisdom is just the word that has come to apply to mean taking those first two and translating into what we do in the world. Now, what you do can also include what you say, right? Because speaking is action. Um, it can apply to what you do to yourself or for yourself, not just for others. Um, but again, this is an interpretation. I always tell people um, if a particular word or a interpretation doesn't work for you and you need to look at it a different way, that's cool. It's more important to understand the concept of going to the, through those three phases of consciousness of the thought in your mind, the knowledge, gaining that knowledge, the understanding, which is more related to the emotion. Is this right? Is this the right thing to do, for example? And then the action is when you put it into, into practice. So this is, again, just my perspective on that, maybe a slightly nuanced way to look at it. 
Um, with respect to getting stuck and is like, you know, inner work, inner work, inner work and not doing anything. I agree. I mean, if you if one only goes within and doesn't actually get out there and do something in the world, then the question becomes, is that are, are we, is that really growth? Is that really participation? Right. So I think, again, I go back to that idea of the middle path. Spending some time doing personal development, working on things, preferably when they come up. So if you notice that there's something that you think would be good to work on, work on it right away. Take action on it. And then once you've done that, release that and say, okay, I've made some changes. I've recognized a few things about myself. Now I'm going to go, I'm not going to you know, sit at home and wonder if, if I was able to figure it out. I'm going to go out in the world and test this out. You know, maybe I'll have a better experience. Maybe I'll have a better interaction, but we, we have to be willing to put ourselves out there at some point. So I definitely do not encourage, you know, becoming a hermit. I don't, I, you know, maybe for some few number of people that works, but I, I don't see it as, as ideal. And I like what you said to end that thought that whatever you write, it's that your consciousness at that moment is what you're putting out there. So it can change. Yep. And then that's when you write book two or three or four. So, thank you. Great questions, Kelly. Thank you. Tom, you've got your hand up. I'd love to hear what you are wanting to say. Oh, I think you're muted, Tom. Although it doesn't, mm, we can't hear you anyway. No. Yeah, I, I can't hear him either. No. Oh. oh A slight darn. tech glitch. Do you want to put it in the chat box? You type your question in the chat box. <laughs> Darn. I know I know it was gonna be good too. Yeah. If I could read lips. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> ah. So I anybody else before I I leap in with my question? Um so you talked about the dual pillars of enlightenment, David, don't harm others and stand up for yourself. And I really, really love that because that does relate to writing a book, especially people who are working on a memoir, is finding that balance between saying things that don't harm other people and yet sticking up for yourself. A lot of our clients have had some uh, perceptively traumatic experiences or difficult experiences. And so it's figuring out how much of that goes in the book. I wonder if you have any tools or tips for differentiating or finding that balance of what should go in the book and what shouldn't go in the book while while maintaining a respect for the dual pillars of enlightenment. Like where, where is that balance point for people? And how, how do you find it? That's a great point. I, I always encourage every person, every individual. I, I like to remind people that your privacy, you have a right to privacy. You do not owe anyone your story, right? It's important that if you decide to share an aspect of your story in context, it has to be from your own free will. And because you thought it was the best thing to do to help that that audience to, to grow and learn, and you are cool with shit, putting it out there, you know, it may be a little uncomfortable. I mean, it's not going to, it's going to be zero discomfort because we're human beings and we feel, but you may accept the discomfort that comes with that because you've made a choice that to sacrifice a certain level of privacy in order to create a greater benefit because you feel like you know, the way, not just the story itself, but the way you're going to share it in context and the examples you're going to give of how everything unfolded is going to lead people to a better outcome, right? So it's not just airing dirty laundry. It's like, yeah, this really bad stuff happened to me. Here's what happened as a result. Here's what I was able to learn from it. Here's how I was able to come out of that in in possibly others could too and here's what i where i am now like look what i've been able to do as a result of you know he, creating some healing in my life so if, if that formula works well then i would say bravo definitely do it if it works but nobody has to, nobody is under any obligation to share any or all aspects of their private life and i encourage people if you would rather stay private that does not make you you less of a human being. And it also doesn't limit your ability to become a sovereign, you know, in the context of what we're talking about. In fact, if anything, if you deem something that you want to keep it private, go for it. Maybe you'll only reveal certain things, right? Rather than the whole story. I've been pressured in the past 
to reveal more than I wanted to. And now look, I didn't really understand at the time, but looking back, I consider it highly disrespectful and even immoral what that person tried to do to get me to share more than my story than I was actually ready to share. Right. And I ended up, unfortunately, I ended up sharing a, not everything, but I shared up a lot more than I was actually really ready to. And looking back, if I, again, if I had understood these concepts, I would have put my foot down and say, you know what? I know some, I know I've been through a lot. I know I've had tough experiences. I'm not, I'm not afraid to say that, but the details, they're not important for me to share right now. You know, maybe at some point I'll share them. So I think that standing up for yourself is also just having a boundary and saying there's a right time and place to do that. Yeah. And, and you have complete control over what appears in that book or whatever the circumstance was and what does not. You, you are the final arbiter of what belongs and what doesn't. So thank you for yep. that. Hannah, I'd love to hear your question. How are you? Good, good to see you. See you, uh, David. What an amazing presentation, and I, I, I learned so much from it. Uh, just to, just to share my story quickly, I became a woman-owned business in nineteen. 94 in a traditionally male dominated in industry, the tool industry, hand and power tools. And um, I connected, thank God I connected with Susan last night and yeah, sh sharing my story and uh, the things that you said to me really resonated with me because it it's an interesting story, but I, I, I won't reveal some, some of the things that I went through. And, um, it, you know, when I when I stepped up to the platform and had to run a business since today, 2023. So, I, you know, your your presentation is ex excellent and it re it's very inspirational. Thank Th you. Th thank you so much. Thank you. Thank I you. Appreciate Hannah. That. So great to see you here. Thank you. Um, maybe one last question. David, because we are running out of time, I would. Yeah, there's a big leap here between is it systems software engineering, systems engineering and software development, and internal monarchy. How did you get there? Like, if if you can share just a little bit about the the leap, what seems to be a leap from software engineering to internal monarchy? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, what I remember is, uh, I what happens is hindsight is always 2020. And so when I look back, I can see kind of how it all unfolded. But I do remember as a young child, even very young child, maybe like, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old, I remember having certain experiences that kind of already made me aware that, that, that I'm, I'm found myself in a reality that was much greater than I could really grasp. And there was a lot going on. And as a kid, I also expressed my creative side. So I would do a lot of drawing, I did a lot of story writing. Um, so I wasn't just I was really into music. I even did some comedy, stand-up comedy as a kid, believe it or not, and like little comedy tapes. I would get friends together and we would do like little recordings, you know, like DJ, you know, making fun of the DJs and whatnot. Um, so I think I always had that, but I think uh, I was also, I also had a very strong aptitude because I, I think I've had a good, like my intellect is pretty strong. So I had a pretty, I software, I just found it very easy to work with. And when I was exposed to it, Around, all around the same time, around the age of 10, 11, I, it's like, this is easy stuff. So I just kind of started programming the computers of that, of that time, which were very, very basic. Literally, it was basic. That was the language. Um, and I just found it like, this is easy. So I just kept going with it. And eventually, you know, in the early part of my career, it just seemed like a good idea. So I kind of continued down that path of studying and then working in software. But I always, at some point, I just, I was starved for more creativity. I guess you could say I could feel myself wanting to get back to a more creative side. And it was just only a matter of time before I started finding my way back to more and more creative pursuits. So it was a logical progression. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, I think we've run out of time. Oh, we're spot on time. How do you know? What do you know about that? That was, that's unbelievable. Amazing. amazing. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, David, for sharing your brilliance with us. This has been a really, really enlightening conversation, literally. <laughs> it's been an enlightening conversation. And I really appreciate 
you being here. How can people work more with you? What what does that look like? And, and how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, I'm very accessible. I'm going to respond to anybody. You know, I would just say, if you just want to reach out for any reason, there's a couple ways. Send me an email, david at freedomvibe.art. Obviously, I'm LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm connected with Susan and actually okay. several other people here. So uh, search for me on LinkedIn with my full name. Uh, if you prefer Facebook, go there as well. These are all uh, easy, you know, easy ways. Like I said, I'm I'm going to make myself accessible. And if you want to have a conversation, we can even jump on a, a, a Zoom call, you know, and and just talk about anything that's on your mind. You know, we can spend an hour together on Zoom if 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 you if you feel called to have that kind of conversation. And I I enjoy. You know, that for me, that's not a burden. I love having conversations as Susan, as you can attest, that's kind of how we got connected. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I would say, you know, just if, if 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 it resonates and something is calling you, just reach out through any of those means. Oh, thank you. Yes, we we have all our own answers, don't we? 